I didn't used to worry about speaking with uh, music stands until I had an iPad that I was afraid could fall off and break. Um, today, uh, this afternoon, I'd like to talk about the gospel, and I want to begin in the second half of the story of gospel. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I have problems with flashing lights and migraines, so the, the light is a little bright, so I'm glad he's shutting those doors back there. Um, I'd like to begin in the second half and then go back to the New Testament. And I would like to begin um, with a bit of a sketch of evangelism in the history of the church in about 10 minutes. The whole church. Evangelism from the second, particularly from the fourth century on, uh, was almost non-existent in the church in the traditional sense of how we understand evangelism because you became a member of the church by baptism. Uh, in the Western church, in the Eastern church, uh, developing after the 10th century uh, in the Eastern church, uh, people were incorporated in the church. So evangelism was was much less of a concern, a pressing concern. There was some evangelism, say St. Francis tried to evangelize a little bit of, of, of uh, in Islam uh, places, but by and large, evangelism was not an issue. Then uh, I believe that it was with Luther and Calvin that the, the tradition of the church was slightly reshaped in the direction of the doctrine of salvation. Soteriology begins to have more influence. Now, clearly, we can see a bit of it in Augustine's Enchiridion. We can see it in Aquinas's Summa Theologica. You can see some of this. But Luther framed a confession at the Augsburg Confession that was fundamentally about salvation. And Calvin with Farrell in Geneva and the Genevan Confession framed uh, the, what we believe through the lens of soteriology and the doctrines of salvation. Um, I, w I was at a conference with Bill Hybels, uh, who's a pretty well-known figure, and Bill asked me um, about evangelism with Luther and Calvin. And I said... By and large, they did not try to get people to make decisions. And he was shocked. And I said, Bill, that did not happen for a long time. This was not the pressing concern. Luther got all those Catholics baptized through power. They, just, they became Lutherans when they took over the German state. And Calvin instituted a, a coercive, more, it's, co it's coercive, in that it's socially constructed, baptism makes you a part of the church, and they want people to be confirmed and have genuine faith. But Luther spent most of his life remonstrating with Lutherans that they didn't live like Christians because he never demanded personal conversion. Baptism took care of it. And Calvin was tighter, uh, but he did the same thing. So uh, when I wrote King Jesus... I did not blame the Reformation. I just pointed my finger at the Reformation as the origin of what I call the Soterian Gospel, and that that Gospel got its origins with the reframing of Christian theology through the lens of the doctrine of salvation. Prior to that, Christian theology was taught through the Apostles' Creed. This is really important, and especially for you and I, uh, and we share a very common anti-creedal tradition. Uh, we the only creed we believe in is the Bible. Is that something you grew up with? Which is a wonderful, uh, mythical tale we tell ourselves, but it's there. And you have just as many church traditions as I grew up with. Just in case you don't know, I'd like to point them out for you if, if you ask. Uh, but... Um, so I began to, I pointed my finger at the Reformation as the beginning of a movement toward um, reframing 
everything about evangelism and the gospel. And I was on radio with Michael Horton, and Michael uh, kindly suggested that I was equating the reformers with pietism. And I probably was. But it was the 17th century in Germany and the 18th century, and it was the 16th century in England with Puritanism that began to focus more on a personal, individual experience. You don't find this in Luther and Calvin. They, they don't ask people, when did you get saved? This is not a question that they were asking. So the question that so much drives Western evangelical evangelism, and, and I'm going to include you in that group, even though I know there's tensions between restoration movement, Christian church, and ev evangelicalism, and I experience it in two directions. I've been pleading with Christianity today to make you a part of the evangelical movement, and they won't do it, and I've got some people in your circles who are mad at me trying to get you into evangelicalism. So I say, okay, I just won't worry about it. Uh, I don't have the power to make it happen. But um, our evangelism that we do is a modern phenomenon. Calvin and Luther did not evangelize the way we do. So I was in, I've been in a quest for the last year trying to figure out how this happened, that we could get to something like the four spiritual laws. And so many people believe that's what the gospel is. I mean, they really do think that that is the gospel. I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that if you were to ask Paul, is that the gospel? I think he'd tilt his head a few times, scratch his head and say, no, I, I don't think that's the gospel. I mean, it's, all, it's pretty nice, but that's not what we call the gospel. So here's, here's the story that I've been able to put together on the... Uh, origins of the gospel that we have, and that's what I'd like to focus on here to begin with. Um, the primary revivalists of the Western evangelical tradition, in the broadest sense, begin with people like George Whitfield and John Wesley. I read about 20 evangelistic sermons of George Whitfield this winter. And I didn't see anything remotely like what we call the gospel. And I read a bundle of John Wesley's sermons. And if you've ever read any of John Wesley's sermons, you know he may have 30 points. Not three, uh, but 30. And it may go on for four hours, uh, his sermons. But Wesley, Wesley uh, almost pushed in the direction of personal decision. Prior to those two guys, you've got in the United States, Jonathan Edwards, genuine revivalist, but anybody who thinks he shortchanged the gospel has no touch with Jonathan Edwards. This guy was a robust, reformed Calvinist, congregationalist evangelist who preached the full counsel of God in that tra traditional sense. And, and he preached it, and he preached it to the point where he made people jump out of their skin uh, in fear. Uh, he was a master of the psychology of the inner soul. Um, the only thing I've seen since Edwards, quite as pre penetrating, but not as penetrating as Edwards, is C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, which is a brilliant insight into how human nature works. But uh, Edwards pressed hard, and, and uh, he, he, he made people fear of God. But what was fascinating is Edwards never finished his sermons trying to get people to make a decision, ever. He would have found that abominable, and he would have called it Pelagian. Had nothing to do with Pelagius, but he would have called it Pelagian, because that's the best term he could use to, to ransack somebody and label them. So they were critical of Whitfield in the post-Edwards era, they were critical of Whitfield because he seemed to suggest that it was within the power of a human to make a decision. Wesley's similar, but never as far as it was later to become. So I would say that the first phase of American revivalism and Western revivalism 
connected to Edwards, Whitfield, and Wesley, you could never find a reductionistic gospel in those, th- in those three people, ever. It's a full-orbed doctrine of salvation approach to gospel. Uh, it's not uh, the ap- what I would call the apostolic gospel. It's a, soteria- a soterian gospel, but it's a fullness. The person that everybody blames, and you can blame without anybody getting mad at you, is Finney. Everybody blames Finney for everything in the problems with evangelism. And there's there's a reason to blame some of Finney. But in uh, in Finney's original preaching, Finney had the mentality that if you created the right conditions in a building, and he had the, you know, he had the anxious bench. He's the first one to to get people to come forward. Finney believed if you played the right music, if you prepared the right way, if you uh, sang the right songs, if you preached the right way, you could, uh, you could produce decisions. But 10 years after Finney's major early revivals, he wrote another book uh, called Lectures on Revival. No, what's it called? Reflections on Revival, not the lectures. The reflections in which he took back a lot of what he had done originally. So Finney saw that he had gone too far himself, and Finney saw himself as a successor to Jonathan Edwards. And I often bring this up around my Calvinist friends, because that just unnerves them. Because Finney is the problem with everything. He's the Arminian, and Finney thought he was the successor to Edwards, and then I let them get mad. They don't have to get mad at me. They can blame it on Finney. So, uh, but I, I, I read through a bunch of Finney's sermons this, this uh, winter, and Finney was like Wesley. He might have 30 or 40 points in a sermon. Theologically rich, even if you don't like his theology, it's theologically informed. It was logical, it was rhetorical, it was rational, uh, it was not at all a plea. Uh, I mean, he could plea with people, but he didn't try to... Uh, push as hard toward the later of his sermons to get people to make a decision and think it was over. So I kept thinking, I, I'm not going to blame Finney as much as others. Who's next? Next in the circuit is, is uh, D.L. Moody. And Moody uh, famously could describe the gospel with three R's. This, as soon as you see this, this, this starts to get me nervous. Three R's. But listen to his three R's. Ruined by the fall, so he's going to begin with a sinful human being. Uh, Second, ransomed by the blood, which is almost always with Finney, is connected a little bit more to penal substitution, but not as strong as it would be with Edwards and the reform side. But the third R in Finney's gospel was regenerated by the Spirit, because with Moody, Finney, Sunday, And the early Billy Graham, it was all about transforming the human individual into becoming a good American citizen. I mean, it was really important about transformation. So Moody Moody mastered uh, media at the time, newspapers, um, uh, telegrams. He mastered that art form of media to get people's attention to his sermons and to get people to come uh, to, to his big evangelistic events. And as I read uh, Moody's sermons, uh, I didn't see him reduce the gospel quite like that. Uh, This was the way people have summarized his gospel, the three R's. But when you get Moody preaching, he doesn't bring... I don't think there's one sermon where he brings in the... He says, now the gospel is the three R's. These themes come up all the time. But he was primarily focused on getting sinful people transformed by the gospel to become holy people who would be good citizens in the United States. Moody. I would like to blame Billy Sunday for more of the problems. But Billy Sunday is, is to me, um, a lesser quality, a bit of a huckster version of D.L. Moody. Uh, As Sunday got older, he strayed farther and farther from the gospel and became more of an entertainer, interested in life. And, and, uh, uh, but 
Sunday's basic gospel was get off the bottle, and the way to get off the bottle was to follow Jesus and to become a Christian. And then you will become a good American citizen. So he, he tied together the prohibition and the gospel and the church and his tents and making money, and that was the Billy Sunday era. I, don't, I think Billy Sunday was really big in his day, but he quickly, his flower faded quickly. So now we're to Billy Graham. And Billy Graham responded to a gospel that is very much like the four spiritual laws, uh, but Billy Graham's gospel cannot be separated from the gospel of Bill Bright. And here, here is where I think it happened. In 1957, Bill Bright was at, it was in California at a retreat for Campus Crusade leaders. I don't know what it was called that time. I think it, it was already called Campus Crusade. And Bill Bright had the belief that you had to memorize the gospel in order to present it. And he made all of his Campus Crusade workers memorize a presentation of the gospel, word for word. And you got credit if you presented the whole thing. If you didn't present the whole thing, you didn't get credit. You had to present it a certain number of times a week to be inside the circle doing the right things. And that's how Bill Bright did it. Bill Bright's gospel was not that far from D.L. Moody and Billy Graham, which was that, uh, that God made us in his image, we're sinners, uh, Jesus died in our place, etc. cetera. Uh, if we accept him by, you know, receive him into our heart, uh, et cetera. But at this retreat in 1957, a businessman was there, and I don't remember his name. The businessman said to Bill Bright, because Bill Bright was struggling with how best to present the gospel for his crusade leaders to memorize. He said to Bill Bright, in sales, you must begin with a positive idea. He said, so I think you need to begin on a positive note because the gospel fundamentally from uh, the Reformation on was about sinners who need to be saved by the grace of God and the, uh, the death of Christ. Billy Graham's early preaching started on a negative note. Then the, uh, Bill Bright responded, and Bill Bright was upstairs, and the uh, salesman was downstairs, and Bill Bright said, I know how to do that. We will say... God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And that is the origins of the modern gospel. Is it is, I think that this influenced Billy Graham to bring in more and more that God loves you and he's gracious and he has a plan for your life. And if you accept this, you'll get the plan that God has for your life. That form of evangelism, I do not believe that I've been able to see was ever present in the Western Church until 1957 with Bill Bright and then Billy Graham. It was also then distributed throughout the world through Henrietta Mears. And I don't know if you know who Henrietta Mears is. Are any of you old enough to know who Henrietta Mears is? Only two people in the room know who Henrietta, three? Henrietta Mears was a Sunday school teacher at Hollywood Presbyterian Church who wrote a book called What the Bible is All About that I think has sold about 8 million copies. And Billy Graham himself gave away 2 million copies in his rallies. And Henrietta Mears taught, a Sunday, taught Sunday school at the, the most influential Sunday school class in the history of the world in, at Hollywood Presbyterian. I think it's Pasadena, isn't it? Is it Pasadena? L.A.? Jimmy Stewart went there? Well, that's nice. I'm glad to know that. But uh, Billy Graham was influenced by Henrietta Mears. Bill Bright was deeply influenced and discipled by Henrietta Mears. And countless leaders that ended up at Wheaton and then have become national leaders came through into the church through Henrietta Mears. So I, at one time, I was doing my best to figure out if 
Billy Graham and Bill Bright got their gospel from Henrietta Mears. And so I've dug out, and I've, I've worked with the people at Gospel Light Publications, and they've, I've dug out all the original copies of Henrietta Mears, but she did not have the God loves you uh, and has a plan for your life until after Bill Bright. So they did not get it from her. She got it from them. So that the gospel that we hear today, that many of us responded to uh, and became Christians as a result of, is largely a, a 1957 manifestation of Western American white evangelical revivalism's gospel. And that is the gospel. And it, it works like this, that God loves you. We don't always now say has a, a wonderful plan for your life. And the four spiritual laws in the modern form, I think, has two forms, and one of them doesn't have that line anymore. All right, the, the move is rhetorical and it is designed to create liminality, and here's how it works. God loves you and has a, a wonderful plan for your life, and then some of them will bring up that God is holy. The Edwards-influenced people bring it up as soon as they can, and some of them don't even want the love of God stuff in there. And if you look at Greg Gilbert's new book on the gospel, What is the Gospel? He minimizes love and then gets to holiness. He doesn't even affirm the importance of the grace of God and the love of God in the gospel. It's about the holiness of God. But the, the, it's entirely positive. God loves you. God is gracious. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He made you, and he's holy. And then we bring in the second phase, and that is that humans sinned. And when humans sinned, it provokes a reaction in the holiness side of God and this puts a human being in a state of liminality, that now God loves them, but he can't love them because they're sinful and they're out of sorts with God, so there's liminality. Then the, the next thing is to, is to draw now on the grace of God that God, in spite of what we have done, uh, worked with us by sending the Son on our behalf and then almost always, if the focus is on the holiness of God, then the cross becomes the, the place where the wrath of God is poured out on humans and justice is satisfied. And then, therefore, our dilemma, our liminality, can be resolved because of what God has done on our behalf. I've always been irritated with the emergent crowd and with the critics of the gospel, and I got a letter about it this morning, and I wanted to write a long uh, response, but I chose not to. And that is that they want to say that God saves us, that God, sa Jesus saves us from God, or God saves us from himself. This is a gross distortion of what penal substitution means in any good theologian's uh, perspective, is that it's always the doctrine of the Trinity involved. It's always God the Father, Son, and spirit involved in the love of God and in the sacrifice. So it's not father against son. There are some people who present it that way, and there's no doubt about it, and they should be burned at the stake. If I were a Calvinist, I could do that. Uh, we don't do that anymore. So Christ dies in our place, largely it's penal substitutionary theory at, at work and propitiation. And if we respond in faith, it's very interesting to me, I cannot get the current reform crowd to do anything other than bring in response by faith. And I've said to them all along, the New Testament says we must repent and believe and be baptized. And Romans 10 says confess. And before long, I'm almost in the restoration movement. I just need, I just need one more. I don't remember whatever what it is, but it's just one more, five. It's a five fingers I was taught. What did I, what have I missed? Here? Here. Yeah, that's not very exciting. You got it. <laughs> I got the four important ones, though, don't I? All right, so, um, but they don't want to bring in repentance or baptism. And I, ca I called some Baptists on that one day. I said, why don't you believe in baptism? Well, they really don't. That's why they go by the name Baptist. It, it really doesn't do a whole lot of good. You don't have to do it. It's really the faith that matters. So they want faith, but the New Testament teaches repentance faith, and baptism, confession. So 
Uh, that is the gospel that I think many of us grew up with. And it is the way we have learned to preach the gospel. It is the way we have learned to expect people to talk about the gospel. And over time of working the New Testament texts and teaching, I became convinced that that was not the gospel, that this is a rhetorical bundle. Every one of these words matters to me. A rhetorical bundle shaped by revivalists in order to precipitate decisions. And that's exactly what it does, and it does it very well. And decisions are inadequate to build a church. In fact, the numbers are astounding. Children who grow up in evangelical homes, defined broadly the way people like Barna and Gallup and those people define evangelical, Children who grow up in evangelical homes, 90% of them make a decision to receive Christ. 90%. That's pretty good. When Barna and Gallup and these others have examined the faith condition of children who grow up in evangelical homes who are 35 years old, they discover that 22% of them bear the marks of being a Christian. Now, of course, they measure that by things like going to church and reading their Bible, which aren't foolproof, but less than that is certainly uh, grounds for suspicion. So the decision approach to evangelism precipitates decisions effectively, but it does not have a very good uh, uh, prospect in producing disciples. And so in King Jesus, I tried to provoke by saying, that the evangelical model of evangelism, which is designed to provoke decisions, is no more effective at making a disciple than the Roman Catholic sacramental method and the Anglican and Lutheran methods of nurturing people into faith through catechism, et cetera, et cetera. And I really believe that, that the Catholics, while they don't have as many um, as Southern Baptists, et cetera, in the United States, uh, Catholics have plenty of really serious Christians, and their percentage, I talked to Christian Smith about this, at, you know, the, the researcher on American religion, and he would say, because they don't measure things quite that way, he said, I think you're fairly close in saying that Catholics are probably as effective at producing disciples, genuinely serious Roman Catholic Christians, at 35 and above, as evangelicals are with their methods. This is a pretty serious indictment. And I believe that in part, not all of it, in part, it's created by the gospel that we preach. That this gospel precipitates decisions and it also precipitates assurance. And if people are quite secure that they're Christian and they're going to heaven because they've received Christ, there's no spur for them to have to push on. My sister is 60 years old. When she left high school, she left our home in 1969 to go to Southern Illinois University. She walked away from Christianity at that point. I think she's been back to church twice since she was 18 years old, 19 years old. And she is 100% confident that when she dies, she will go to heaven. She has nothing to do with the church nothing to do with Jesus Christ, nothing to do with the faith, anything. But she's confident because she, re she received Christ when she was five, uh, just like most little Baptist kids do. So um, one of my contentions then is an analysis of what this gospel is that we understand and then to compare that with what the New Testament teaches the gospel is, all right? I want to stop at this point to see if you have, I can have questions See if you have questions about what I've said on what the gospel is, and uh, then we can move forward. On yes? Last, on the last point, I assume it's based on uh, the idea of the implication for America in the question of the evangelical orthodox. Eastern Orthodox? Would that be involved in the evangelical? Uh, you mean the, the production of serious Christians? Yes. 
I, I, don't, I don't know the numbers on Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, I, I could guess, but there's, I mean, it's just a guess, so who cares? My guess is no better than your guess, probably, unless you know more about it than I do. But uh, I don't know the percentage of Orthodox Christians that would be, who are baptized, who when they're 35 and above are really serious about their faith. I don't know the number. But I, at, teaching at North Park, I had a lot of really serious Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christian uh, students. And, and I loved them. The, it, 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 it should be. Um, and their culture, uh, if they grow up in a culture, let's say they grew up in, um, for instance, I had a student one time who was an Iraqi Orthodox Christian. And she was very serious about her faith. And that's because she grew up in a world that hated her faith. And it was very difficult. So that tension created a more serious commitment to her faith. If you grew up in an Eastern Orthodox world where the Orthodox Church is no different than the rest of the culture, it, it would be, you know, it's like any other state-sponsored religion. Not very effective. All right, others? Anyone else? Yes. The slogan that's kind of been uttered in the halls of Ozark Christian College for years has been, uh, you win people to what you win them with. It's kind of like, it's almost what you're saying. A little yeah. Bit oh, I would agree with that, is that if, if our gospel is this, you know, four spiritual laws gospel, we're gonna, that's what we're going to get them to. And then we're going to spend a lot of our time trying to coax them into being disciples. Yes. I would agree with you. I, I, didn't, I wasn't saying anything about causation. I said, I do think it's connected. And I think it's exactly what, what the, dean, the dean, right? What he said is that uh, if our aim is to precipitate a decision with the hope that the decision will lead to disciple, but no necessity that it will, then that's what we will produce we will produce people who have made decisions and we will have some of them that it's, it digs deeper and, and they give their life to Christ and they become more full-orbed Christians. So I, I think the message that we create and the environment that it's connected to will shape the sort of product we get. And, and that's why I would say that... Um, I mean, I can give you personal experiences of people, but I don't think an anecdote is, is the way to go. I just think that if we produce, if we preach that gospel, we will get what that gospel achieves, which is a decision to accept Christ into my life. But that does not make a disciple. Jesus was not out trying to get people to accept him into their lives. Is that? Is it? Yeah, I would agree with that. That's why the environment matters. For instance, um, I taught at Trinity for 12 years, and I had an ongoing, very quiet feud with the evangelism professor named John Nyquist. And, I, and John, I used to critique the four spiritual laws as not the gospel of Jesus. And he used to say to me, how many people did you lead to Christ this week? Now, that was his response. And he'd say, I had six. How about you? And I would say, how many of them became disciples? And here's what I used to say to John quite often. In your hands, the four spiritual laws is a much better instrument than in a lot of people's hands. Because he was a seriously committed Christian who lived out the gospel and he created an environment where you understood what he was saying was giving your life to Jesus, not just making a decision. But revivalist preaching on TV tends to go in that direction. Right. Um, I would like to look at one passage today, uh, and we're gonna look at Acts chapter 10. 
But I, would, uh, I want to make a point about uh, the book, The King Jesus Gospel, because this is really important to me about the book and the project and how everything works. And that is, uh, as I study the gospel, and I worked on this theme for the better part of 10 years, uh, it was always percolating in my head. And I frequently asked my students and pastors where I was speaking and people that I was around, I pestered people with this question. What do you think the gospel is? How do you define the gospel? I asked people this all the time. And uh, in working through the Bible on these themes, I kept asking myself the question of method. If we're going to define what the gospel is, what texts are we going to use? Where do we go to find answers to this question? Well, my, my historically minded friends who want to begin with Jesus, as I do, particularly because I have an Anabaptist theme in my life, um, wanted me to begin with Jesus and the kingdom. And I said, here's what's going to happen I, when I would tell my friends. If I begin with Jesus in the kingdom, everything hinges upon how I define kingdom. And if they like my definition of the kingdom, they'll be fine. If not, they'll say, you got it wrong at the beginning. So I knew the people that I was taking direct aim at had to do with the evangelical reformed crowd because they're the ones who are defining the gospel for us. Largely, the reform crowd has defined the gospel in revivalism. So I said rhetorically to myself, I am going to begin with Paul because that's where they begin. And then I'm going to turn Paul inside out for them and get back to Jesus and show that they also are not understanding Jesus properly. So that was my aim. But methodologically, I came to the conclusion that there are three places that we must go first to define the gospel, and everything else comes second. First, we have to go to 1 Corinthians 15, because it is the only text in the New Testament that defines the gospel. And there's a debate here. We can debate it all we want. Does the gospel end at verse 5? Does it end at verse 8? Does it end at verse 9? Or does it end at verse 28? Within the text of the gospel, a lot of people want to connect it. In, with, uh, within the text of 1 Corinthians 15, they want to stop it at verse 5. I'm, I'm fine with that. It's wrong, but I, if you're going to go on the clipped language that seems like quoting of a tradition, it seems to stop at verse 5. You can expand it to verse 9, but Paul's starting to get expansive there. It doesn't sound like that. Christ died, he was raised, buried, raised, etc., in light of what I found in the book of Acts, I believe that Paul's statement of the gospel does not end until verse 28. But that's a debate, and I didn't want to make that the, the crucial issue. So I thought, we have to begin with 1 Corinthians 15. The second place we have to go to understand the gospel are the gospel sermons in the book of Acts. And this is my logic, and I know I'm right there is a really good chance that when Peter and Paul preached the gospel, they knew what they were doing. I really believe that. So that when they preached the gospel in the book of Acts, we can trust that that's what the gospel was. I cannot tell you the number of people who really don't believe that. I had a conversation with a major website leader and I said to him, do you think Peter preached the gospel? He said, yes. I said, but you've told me the gospel is justification by faith. That's the gospel. I said, then why don't Peter and Paul preach justification by faith in the book of Acts? Here's what his response. They do. It's in every line that they breathe. I said, but they never say it. How do you know it's there? Because you can't understand them if you don't know justification by faith, which is, to me, is vicious, circular reasoning. I know it's there because it's not there because you can't understand it unless you impose it. Once you impose it, then you understand it. Well, this is not the way we operate in biblical studies. And I know the restoration people are on my side on this. Let's let the Bible say what it says. You know, who cares what we believe? So... 
I said, let's look at these sermons in the book of Acts. There are seven of them, eight of them, maybe only six, maybe only five. I just got a letter from someone who says, I don't think you can count Acts 14. Acts 2, Peter, big sermon. This one really counts. Acts 3 and 4, condensed summaries. Not, they don't count quite as much. Acts 10 to 11, big one, full one, counts a lot. Furthermore, he's preaching to a Gentile. I don't care if he's a God-fearer. He's a Gentile. He is not circumcised, and that's what matters. All right? No blade on that guy yet. All right? Then you've got Acts 13, Paul preaching in Pisidian Antioch. You've got another gospel sermon. Then a really short one in Acts 14, and my friend just wrote me and said, he doesn't think there's enough Christology there for it to count. Okay, we'll cut, we'll cut out Paul. He doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> and then Acts 17, which I think is the first ever seeker-sensitive service. Because there Paul is preaching on the Areopagus in a philosophically compelling way, or he's trying to be philosophically compelling, but it's sort of pre-evangelism. It's not quite the gospel. But those are the sermons in Acts. If I had to pick them, I'd pick Acts 2 and Acts 10 to 11. Then I'd have Acts 13, and then the rest of the summaries can be brought in. And here's what I concluded. I hope you agree with me, because if you don't, you're wrong. That's the way I look at it. And that is... What Peter and Paul preach in, Act, in the book of Acts is what Paul outlined in Acts 15. Fundamentally, the gospel is to tell the story of Jesus according to the scriptures. In other words, it's the story of Israel coming to fulfillment in the story of Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who is Lord, therefore King, and the one who saves. All right, so... That's that. Then, the third place we go, this is an amazing one to me, and that is, I believe that there is a reason why the first four books of the New Testament are called the gospel. And I believe it is because they are the gospel. Now, there are a lot of people who don't think that's true. I was playing golf. You can look this up on my blog to figure out who it was with. I won't give you his name playing golf with a Christian leader this year. And I was irritated with him. And I said to him, so, do you think the Gospels are the Gospel? And he said, no. And I didn't know what to say. I thought, if they're not the Gospel, why are they called the Gospel? It's because that's the genre. And I heard D.A. Carson say it this week online, that... They, they weren't called the gospel until the second century, which might be right. I think it's wrong. But that doesn't change the matter. They flesh out what's in 1 Corinthians 15, and C.H. Dodd taught this a long time ago in his famous lectures on the apostolic preaching. So Mark, I believe, when he begins with the gospel, I think he's actually talking about his book. Matthew twice brings up the gospel. The word gospel was added to the text later. We don't know how much later, but that's because they thought these books told the gospel. Interestingly, and I think this is a telling observation that critiques anyone who says it's not the gospel, it wasn't until about 170 A.D. that anyone used ta evangelia, the gospels, Prior to that, it was ta evangelion, the gospel. So they would just say, and we read from the gospel. And they could be reading from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It was the gospel. It was the one gospel as told by Matthew. Not gospels, as if it's a genre of literature, but the one gospel. Now, these are my three arguments, or the three pillars on which everything stands. 1 Corinthians 15 is the gospel, and it tells us that the gospel is to tell the story of Jesus in light of the story of Israel, coming to completion in Jesus as Messiah. The second one is the apostolic sermons, which the fullness are Acts 2 and Acts 10. And that is clearly... Uh, very much along the line of 1 Corinthians 15. 
And then the third one is that it is filled out with the Gospels as the Gospel. If that is the Gospel, if this is correct, if that method is right, and I cannot tell you the number of people who think the way to define the Gospel is to exegete the book of Romans, that Romans is the Gospel. And so therefore, the Gospels can't be the Gospel because they're not teaching justification by faith. Although we can, we can get a little bit of Jesus in that direction. So if those three pillars are correct, then I think we would define the Gospel as the story of Israel coming to completion in the story of Jesus, who is Messiah. So that calling Jesus Messiah is fundamentally the aim of all Gospel preaching. Now, this is very Jewish. This is why he becomes Lord more in the Gentile context. That's the uh, Greek and Latin translation. Now, Lord uh, is not the same word in Greek as it is in Latin. I know that. But uh, Lord becomes the category for the Gentiles that corresponds to Messiah uh, for the Jews. So Jesus is Lord and Messiah, Messiah and Lord. Messiah for the Jews, particularly Lord for the Gentiles, and he saves in light of that. So, Acts chapter 10. Here's Peter at one of the most beautiful places in the Mediterranean, at Caesarea Maritima, and if you've been there uh, on, a, on a sunny day, which a lot of them are, uh, you can just say, this, was, this is a great place to get to preach the gospel. When I was at Caesarea Maritima, I wanted to open up my Bible and read this text. Just read it. I didn't care if anyone was listening to me at all. But I was trying to translate the mosaics on the floor. I spent my time doing that instead of preaching. All right. And you know this great story of Cornelius and Peter and their visions, and they come together. And then Peter began to speak. And the first thing I think that for the gospel is that Peter realizes the gospel is for all people. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts, accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. This is a profound step forward in earliest Christianity. Jews believed that they were a cut above the rest. That is humor about circumcision. This is, uh, and they, and, and this is, the doctrine of election shapes everything about Judaism. So when Peter says, I now realize that God does not show favoritism, he has just given away the whole nation. This is threatening to everything in Judaism. And all the Jewish literature prior to Jesus is about is this doctrine of election is shaping everything. And accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Now, you, can, you know as well as I do probably that this verse can be used in two really different directions. One is the anonymous Christian direction of Karl Rahner. Do you know about the anonymous Christians? The people who don't know they're Christians but are, but they don't believe in Jesus, but they do, that sort of thing. And Rahner, what Rahner meant by that is no more clear than what Bonhoeffer meant by religionless Christianity. We might as well quit trying to uh, ask them. They, they didn't tell us enough. But some people take this in a very broad sense, that this is how God works in all the nations, and if they haven't heard about Christ, he accepts those who fear him and does what is right. While there are others who would say this is about uh, those who do fear God, God will eventually manifest himself to them. And that's a form of inclusivism that uh, Terry Thiessen teaches. All right, so, but Peter has to understand that the gospel is for all. Now, if you're into this new perspective stuff, which I am, because my teacher is the new perspective guy, Jimmy Dunn, um, this is exactly what the new perspective see, sees as the focal point, the entry point of the gospel, of the New Testament message, is that it's for all. It's fundamentally for all people. So there's the breaking down of ethnic privilege. All right? You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, and now the gospel, announcing or gospeling the gospel of peace, 
And I think this peace is not inner peace. It's not peace in the soul. This is peace between Jews and Gentiles. And that's why he says, peace through Jesus the King, or King Jesus, who is Lord of all. Not just Jews, but Lord of Jews and Gentiles. And that's why I think that peace, uh, the peace is central to the gospel of the New Testament. All right? You know what has happened throughout the providence of Judea, beginning in the Galilee after the baptism that John preached or gospeled. So the gospel begins with John the Baptist. Fantastic. That's right where Mark 1 begins, John the Baptist. That's where Matthew begins with a genealogy attached to the beginning. All right, so everything begins with John the Baptist. How God, and now he's going to tell us about Jesus. He's preaching the gospel. How God anointed Yeshua of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Uh, an element that is frequently neglected in our Christology is the pneumatology inherent in what Christ is all about, is that he lived in the power of the Spirit. And how he went around doing good, and this is a great word about benevolence in the Roman world particularly, and it primarily means doing good things for society, and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. This is evoking, again, the presence of the Spirit upon Jesus, giving him the power to do what he did. Peter is preaching the gospel, and what's he telling us about? He's telling us about the life of Jesus. We are witnesses, and that's the fundamental posture of an evangelist, is to witness to Jesus, tell people about Jesus, of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And this is very interesting. Peter changes his language. In Acts 2, 3, and 4, in the early chapters, Peter will say, you killed him. And now Peter says, they killed him. All right, so Peter sees the cross as an act of injustice uh, meted out by unjust rulers. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. Notice he has hanging there. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. And then he was not seen by all people. See, this is like 1 Corinthians 15, it goes on. Um, here is what we tell people. We tell people the story of Jesus, that he was unjustly killed, that he entered into the grave, and he came back alive by an act of God. All right? This is my favorite analogy. It works, especially with college students, so use it. Uh, I would encourage you. Here's our gospel. Watch Aslan roam in Narnia. Look, they've trapped the lion. They put him on a stone table. Now look, he's dead. But look again. The stone table cracked. Aslan is in the land again, and we hear him roaring. He's roaring for us. Now, that is a really good story, isn't it? I mean, when you read that, Chronicles of Narnia, Volume 1, you go, "Woo! he's back alive again. That's the gospel right there. We're telling the story that Aslan is roaming in the land again. He came back alive. That is a really good story. When C.S. Lewis was done, he didn't have a footnote at the bottom, and he, say, he didn't say, it's now time to pray and receive Christ into your heart. Instead, he allowed you to get carried away with Aslan coming back to a, a life again, and here's what happened. When you read that story, you said, I wish I could climb on the back of that lion's back and put my face in his fur and in his mane, didn't you? That's the point of the gospel is to make people fall in love with the story of who Jesus is and what God did to him. And then they become intoxicated with Jesus. Now this sounds like John Piper, doesn't it? It's to become Christ-intoxicated people that we love to tell the story about Jesus, that he died, that he lived, that he died, he was buried, but by golly, the stone cracked and he came back alive again and he's in the land and he's coming back again. 
That's the story of, that's the gospel right there. Yes, that saves us, but it saves us because the fundamental problem of the gospel, the fundamental problem of humans is not the wrath of God. The fundamental problem in the Bible is death. So the fundamental solution is not that he died for our sins, but that he rose from the dead. We have book after book after book about the crucifixion and atonement theology. It's enough to make me want to write a book about it, which I did. No more. I'm tired of atonement. All people do is get mad about atonement theories. But nobody ever gets mad about resurrection theology because we don't have one. You know, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and we preach it on Easter. And we preach it, if we're really clever, at funerals. But other than that, resurrection doesn't matter in our Christian theology. Look about it. Go look in your bookshelves. A friend of mine did a word search at the Gospel Coalition website. 37 to 1 references to crucifixion versus resurrection. This is where our theology is in evangelicalism. We are cross-obsessed. And yes, it's an empty cross, but we are not resurrection-obsessed. And we need to restore the balance. In the book of Acts, the fundamental gospel message was not atonement theology. Have you read these sermons? It's resurrection theology. They preached the resurrection of Jesus. So we need, I think, to emphasize resurrection. So Peter preached that Jesus came back to life. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. There's a little apologetic in there that it was a bodily resurrection. And this is why Tom Wright is so right when he keeps saying that resurrection in the New Testament is not about life after death. He has this clever expression, it's about life after life after death. It's in other words, it's not just immortality, it's not just survival, it is about a renewed kind of life in the resurrection body, in a resurrection world, the new creation, the kingdom of God, new heavens and new earth. So that's why Peter emphasizes that. He commanded us to gospel to the people, that's the Jews, and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. There's the judgment theme. And now Peter brings in, uh, I think this is because he's talking to a Gentile audience, he waited till the end, all the prophets of Israel testify about Jesus, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So resurrection then creates the implication of the gospel, which is exactly what 1 Corinthians 15, one, uh, 3 through 5 was, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised according to the scriptures, etc. So the death of Jesus and the resurrection bring the forgiveness of sins through his name. Gospel preaching is about telling the story of Jesus in a way that leads to people seeing that their sins can be forgiven. While Peter was still preaching these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message, the gospel. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished. I love this, because Peter had already come to this conclusion, but now they came to the conclusion. They were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Dallas Cowboy fans or Green Bay Packer fans with cheese heads which is really disgusting. It's the Gentiles that received the Holy Spirit, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely on the basis of an experience of seeing people's lives changed or an experience of the Spirit, he says, surely no one can stand in the way of their having been baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So are the ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus, the king, when they asked Peter to stay with him for a few days. All right, now, as a historian, 
And as a person who has spent a lot of his life studying conversion and proselytism, it is absolutely amazing that circumcision does not come up here. This is the issue. This is how you entered the people of God in the ancient world, if you were a male. You had to get circumcised. Circumcision does not come up in these conversion stories until Acts 15 with the Torah-infested people who think if you're going to fully convert into the deeper life, you must also get circumcised. And James uh, is the leader of the Jerusalem church, and he leads them to see that they only have to follow the Torah so far as it's for Gentiles. Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. Leave them alone. But Peter intuited this, it appears, earlier than this. And I, and I have to tell you that I think only the historians who care about proselyte theology and proselyte laws see how unusual this is for a Jewish group seeing a conversion like this of Gentiles and not expecting circumcision. So Peter intuited that since they had the Holy Spirit, they didn't need anything else. That's an amazing conclusion. All right, any questions on, on I think the gospel then, uh, I think that what we have to become more concerned with in gospel preaching is to tell people about Jesus. All right, here's my favorite, uh, one of my favorite images for this. When Chris and I were in, we were in Italy, we wandered into a village called Lucignano. Now, Lucignano is not on Rick Steves' map, and Rick Steves is the Bible for all American tourists. But we wandered on it because we were going to Cortona from Siena, and we drove around this little village on the top of a hill, and I said to Chris, we got to stop here and just see what it is. And we walked in, and it was a gorgeous little village, and we said, we'll go to Cortona, and we'll have dinner in Lucignano. And we had a marvelous risotto dinner looking over the Tuscan hills of Cortona. And when we were done, we went for a walk, a stroll. If you call it in Italy, it's a stroll. In the evening sun, and we walked up, and there was tape across the street, and they said they're videoing a, a, a movie. So we walked around so that we could see the video of the movie, and I saw the actress, and it was uh, Juliette Binoche. All right, pretty famous actress, filming a movie called Certified Copy, and we sat there and watched it. And as I watched it, I kept thinking, she was the actress in Chocolat. Now, if you saw Chocolat, it is a brilliant movie that contrasts this gypsy woman who comes in with her daughter into a Lenten period in a French Catholic community where the leaders have stifled the community through the church. And she sets up a chocolateria next to the church. And the chocolaterie heals people because they find relationships and acceptance, etc. even during Lent. They, they start eating chocolate during Lent. You know, right, that's right in everybody's face. And the church can't heal, but chocolate can. And it's an image uh, that we have to discover what the true chocolate is. And the chocolate of the church is not the institution. It's not Lent. It's not the buildings. It's Jesus. He's our chocolate. He's the one who tastes good. And our goal is is to tell people about Jesus. And um, I taught college students for 17 years. And I got to teach almost every semester a course on Jesus of Nazareth. And I had anywhere from 50 to 100 students every semester taking a course about Jesus. And when I had over 70 to 100, Every semester I taught the course on the basis of final uh, evaluations that they did, I discovered that about 10 of them were giving their life to Jesus because half of our students were non-Christians. It's an incredible opportunity for evangelism. I told the president, I'm, I'm just teaching them about Jesus. I'm not evangelizing. Of course, in my theory, that was evangelism, but he didn't know that, and that's fine. So... I saw between 10 and 20 students a year become Christians. And all I did was tell them about Jesus.
Here's something I think you've got, we got to understand. We have got an amazing message with Jesus. We just need to preach that. It is, Jesus is incredibly attractive. And my friend Dan Kimball has a book called They Like Jesus But Not the Church. So he said, what do you think about my book? I said, well, then let's give them Jesus. This may reduce us to preaching the message of the gospel to people. We want to talk to you about Jesus. And I find it much easier in conversations on planes, trains, in public places to bring up Jesus rather than to try to finagle them into the four spiritual laws and give them a Bill Bright presentation. Because people are interested in Jesus. And I think as churches, if you're struggling with reaching into your community, become a center where people can ask the question, who was Jesus? Every evangelistic sermon, I think, should aim at that question and try to lead people to make responsible decisions of who they think Jesus is. Because if you decide that Jesus is King and Lord and Savior, you'll pray more than the sinner's prayer. You'll pray the surrender prayer. You'll give your life to Jesus, the way C.S. Lewis did. He's, his, his whole line of conversion is, I gave in. That's, that's the prayer of conversion right there. You're giving up. You're giving it all to God. So... Um, we could do Acts 2, you can do the other shorter passages, but I think that this is, uh, if this is the gospel, and this is to the Gentiles, this is the gospel that we preach, we tell people about the life of Jesus. That's gospeling in our world. All right? I think revivalism led us off track, and we have reduced the gospel to a rhetorical bundle that precipitates decisions and it is deconstructing the church. So, questions? Criticisms? Yes? So, if you are making a gospel presentation to a friend who you're trying to reach, can you give us an example of things you would want to make sure you include in that conversion? I think every passage in the gospels is an evangelistic episode. Every passage. The pericopes of the Gospels, they're all evangelistic. And I think they show the multitude of ways of focusing on Jesus. So it, it's always going to be shaped for me in the context of what that person's life and story is about. I thought yesterday on the plane it was going in that direction. And then he started talking about golf, and he was mad at his daughter because she had an iPad and didn't need one and all this stuff. So... Um, I, I want to provoke people into answering the question, who do you think Jesus was? I want them to make a decision about Jesus, his status. It's hermeneutics. What label will you give Jesus? Every conversation, I think, goes in that direction. And I, I'm, I'm lucky because for 17 years I evangelized all year long with college students who then would come and ask me questions. So it was a very soft opportunity. I get this question frequently in the emails and they'll say, okay, but you've only got three minutes. And I will always say, where did you get the idea that we can do this in three minutes? I don't think we can. I don't see any reason why we should. But I think we can point people to Jesus in a multitude of ways. Don't you think that we, we also struggle quite a bit with the language of belief, too? Um, as far as understanding belief from our context and not necessarily understanding what it meant to believe in Jesus the way that the... Yeah, because belief in ours is, is like, I believe certain things to be true, you mean? Whereas in the first century, believing is a, is a surrendering. It's trust. So we, we would do well, I think, to emphasize the word trust and surrender as the goal of what evangelism is, is to get people to surrender their hearts, their souls, whatever word you want to use for the inner core of a person, to God in Christ and believe him.
that approach might though lead to a weak ecclesiology. Oh, it is a weak we got we got it going, man. We got a weak ecclesiology and evangelicalism. Um With her? Well, she would go to church in a minute, and she does when she can. She, you know, and she takes off her hijab and looks like a normal Muslim, you know, uh, Arab woman. Um, but we really have, um, you know, modernity's individualism has conspired very successfully to deconstruct the corporate nature of our self consciousness and of church. It has become a place of volunteers. You know, we want to soften the border between the church and the world so much that it is no longer the gathering of the holy. It is seeker-friendly service. I don't know about that. When, When a, I mean, I like the idea that Pagans can come into our church and feel comfortable, but only so far. They ought to feel uncomfortable. If the gospel is going to make us uncomfortable, if a pagan is someone who is not surrendered to Jesus, they should feel uncomfortable. That's fine to feel uncomfortable. So, um, I do think that we're going to have to, I think churches are going to, Uh, have to reconstruct and build better church consciousness on the basis of discipleship rather than just having made a decision. We have so many churches. In fact, uh, I I believe that that gospel of individualism actually deconstructs church, and I mean ecclesiology, because it's pure individualism. Uh, And and I I think it's going to take a generation of the next generation of young Christians willing to, to live within the confines of an ecclesial community in a conscious way so that it constrains their life as it expands it and opens it up. Uh, Until we see this modeled, we're gonna have a hard time. And I think that's why we have neo-monastic movements, why we have so many people wanna live in community. They know it should be better than what we've got. But we struggle in the the low low church, free church, ecclesia. Yeah. Education. They think they're fine just because granddad built that church and they go to the potluck. And so, in an unhealthy, of course, yeah. social, but they actually never made a personal decision for Jesus. They've just been going to church for 30 years and they think corporately they're justified. Yeah, and that's the other end of the, same, the problem. It's the spectrum right, right here. We need, uh, we need a balance. But I think you see in the New Testament ecclesiology, the fundamental word I would see in the New Testament for the church is koinonia, fellowship. And that is a living together in the life of God, in the, through the Spirit, under Christ, with one another, committed to living with one another. Um, I won't do this here. I'm working on a book on Paul. And ever since I wrote Jesus' Creed, when I wrote Jesus' Creed, which is about loving God and loving others, I wanted to avoid defining love partly because I wasn't satisfied with any definition I'd seen, and partly because I didn't want the book to rest on a definition. But I've come to a definition of love that I think is preachable and useful in church context, and I've tried it out with my students for the last seven years in a course I teach, I taught on this subject. I think love uh, is that if, when you look at a dictionary, it's all about affections, and C.S. Lewis fought against that, but I think C.S. Lewis's definition of love was too cold. To define love in the Bible, I think we have to begin in the right place, and we must begin with how God related to Israel and to the church. And his fundamental relationship to Israel and the church is, is in a thing called covenant. And covenant theology betrays three prepositions. And this defines love. 
Love is a rugged commitment. I like the word rugged because love is not always smooth sailing. It's a rugged commitment to be with someone. This is the fundamental preposition of God. I will be with you. And then the temple, or the, or the tabernacle, and then the temple is the presence of God with us. And then the incarnation is God with us. And at the Revelation 21 and 22, God finally dwells with us. With us is there. So it's a rugged commitment uh, to be with someone as someone who is for that person. So with and for. Now you just think about marriages. Right there, marriages break down when husbands and wives don't spend enough time with one another, or even if they're with one another, they're not for one another. But in the Bible, love is not simply tolerance. To be with someone and for someone can lead to the Western doctrine of tolerance. In the Bible, it is a rugged commitment to be with someone, for someone, unto kingdom realities. There is a teleology to all love in the Bible. God loves us to make us holy. We love one another in order that we might become Christ-like. So all love is, has those three prepositions, with, for, and unto. That's three points of a sermon, and it's a lot. I'm telling you, I worked on this for a long time, and it's the only thing that made sense for my students who then understood, I would have students and say, this under, I now understand why my parents' marriage broke up. And I mean, they usually tell me this in tears. Uh, I understand uh, why... Uh, why Jesus calls us to enemy love because I do not want to be with some, that person and when I am with them, it starts to break things down. I start to melt and I don't want to do that. I want to be angry. So with, for, that whole idea is to be for someone and then unto. Now this morning I told the story about A.W. Tozer who's known for holiness. Brilliant. Tozer was a horrible husband. He was neither with nor for, but probably unto. And if you don't have the with and the for, the unto is hollow. It's like the father who wants his kids to become Christians, but he won't stop working in order to spend enough time to get to know them by being with them and for them. If the kids don't perceive the for, it's because they're not with and there's going to be no unto. When Tozer died in 1963, one year later, his wife, Ada, got remarried. I think the guy's name was Norman or something like that. She said later, she said, Aiden, which is A.W.'s first name, Aiden loved Jesus so much, he couldn't be with me. My new husband loves me. As a damning uh, indictment of a man's life. Committed to holiness, but it didn't lead to love. So love, I think love is really central here. So ecclesiology, all right, I've talked on too much. Hmm? Unto, I would call you kingdom, it's the eschaton. Kingdom realities, Christ-likeness, holiness, love, whatever. Uh, 